Thank you, Matteo and Alberto and Elvira and all the other mumblers. Um, you see, do you see a PowerPoint on which is written the structure of phenomenal justification? All right. All right, so um, the structure of my paper is as follows. First, I'll introduce a view which I'll call phenomenal dogmatism, claiming no uh, originality there. Then I'll present an objection from the extant literature to this uh, view. I'm going to uh, tell you what the standard response to this is, which um, invokes the content attitude distinction. And for, this will lead me to a general challenge to phenomenal dogmatism, what that I call the uniqueness challenge, and I'll propose an answer to this challenge, which will invoke again centrally the content attitude distinction, hence the distinction between, uh, hence the relevance to uh, to the question of the relationship between intentionality and consciousness. Also, I should mention that uh, today's talk will feature the work of British artist Gwyneth Rowlands, uh, work which is not relevant in any way to anything I'm going to talk about. And it's just there to uh, make the making of PowerPoints marginally less tedious. I think someone's mic is open. It might be Elvira's. Oh, yes. All right. Um, what I call phenomenal dogmatism is the following view. It's the idea basically that some experiences can justify some beliefs immediately. So for some experience E and belief B, one, E provide immediate prima facie epistemic justification for B, and two, E does so in virtue of at least some of E's phenomenal properties. That, um, that is what I am going to call phenomenal dogmatism. So it's an epistemological claim. Now, there are several technical terms here. First, immediately in the present context just means independently of the subject's justification for any of their other beliefs. Prima facie here means um, in a way that admits of being uh, overridden or undercut by, um, by additional evidence. And epistemic Justification is just to contrast with other kinds of justification, like moral justification. Carl, could you? Yes, thank you. Um, so if you take, um, you know, suppose, uh, I imagine that Cristiano Ronaldo believes that he is the best football player in the world. And epistemically, it's not justified because, you know, seriously, um, we know it's messy. But uh, practically, it's justified for uh, Cristiano Ronaldo to believe this because it makes him play better. So in one sense, he's justified in having this belief. In another sense, he's not justified. I'm interested in the sense in which he's not justified. Uh, the sense that there's nothing to uh, recommend the truth of the view. Now, this is a, you know, a multi, uh, uh, multi-component view. Here's a uh, portable version. Uh, phenomenal dogmatism is haiku. It goes like this. Experiences, some beliefs do justify without any help. This is taken from footnote eight in Jim Pryor's paper, The Skeptic and the Dogmatist. 
just kidding. There are no haikus in that paper. I've composed it specially for you guys. Now, um, why would you be motivated to believe phenomenal dogmatism? Um, in addition to a haiku, I composed a fairy tale to, to bring out the motivation for the view. And I'm now going to read to you the fairy tale. Once upon a time, a fair princess woke up from a groggy, unexpected nap and found herself in a pitch dark room that felt unfamiliar. A warm voice startled her with a greeting and a question. Do you A, believe that there is a chair in the room? B, disbelieve that there is a chair in the room? Or C, suspend judgment about whether there is a chair in the room? Right after she answered, the lights came on and the princess had a vivid perceptual experience as of a chair right in front of her. The warm voice came on again and asked her whether she A, believed that, B, disbelieved that, or C, suspended judgment about whether there is a chair in the room. Now, the moral, every fairy tale needs a moral. The moral here is it's, uh, you know, if this fairy tale is any, any way like uh, me, um, she would first suspend judgment because she's in a pitch dark room that she doesn't know. And then when she suddenly has perceptual phenomenology as of a chair, she's going to switch from suspending judgment to believing. Still suspending judgment after you have this perceptual phenomenology seems like a perverse level of epistemic consciousness. And this suggests that perceptual phenomenology has some kind of uh, epistemic oomph. It can justify you in rationally switching from disbelieving a proposition, sorry, from uh, suspending judgment about a proposition to believing it. Now, there is an objection that you might have that um, if the whole story is the same, except that the lights don't come on, and instead of a perceptual, a vivid perceptual experience, the princess has a vivid imaginative experience as of a chair. Um, and let's stipulate it's uh, just as vivid as the perceptual experience is. I'm going to return in uh, a few minutes to whether I'm entitled to stipulate this. Um, then it seems now that if she just has this imaginative uh, phenomenology, however vivid, that doesn't justify her in switching from suspending judgment to believing. So uh, uh, could it really be the phenomenology that justifies this switch, this epi epistemic switch? There are two ways to respond to this. Um, and there are basically two ways of denying that perceptual phenomenology and imaginative phenomenology are the same in these cases, in these two stories, these two princess stories. The first version is to say that the chair equality of imaginative chair phenomenology can never match the, the chair equality of a perceptual chair phenomenology. Concentrate as hard as you might, you cannot conjure up an image of a chair quite as vivid, acute, and detailed as any average perceptual experience of a chair. Now, the main phenomenal dogmatists, um, the most uh, prominent phenomenal dogmatists, like uh, Mike Humer and Jim Pryor, do not take this line. And I, I, I think they, there are good reasons to do that. First of all, it's not really clear that for the concern to arise, this needs to be nomologically possible. Um, perhaps being, it being metaphysically or logically possible is sufficient to uh, raise. So the idea that some creature can have an imaginative experience just as vivid as my perceptual experiences, some possible creature. In addition, there is a point made by Alex Burns somewhere, you know, 
visualize, if you will, a camel. Now, we can imagine a, uh, an illustrator who unwittingly is, is illustrating a, a, a camel that looks exactly like the camel you imagine. So it's a very kind of vague, floaty kind of camel, just like the one you just visualized. And maybe looking at that picture, that illustrator's picture in the right conditions would produce the exact same phenomenology, but perceptual, that your imaginative phenomenology of the camel has. And also, you know, I think it's actually um, pretty likely that there are many cases of um, matching vivacity and acuity and detail if we just go outside the visual and maybe tactile domains. So if I, you know, imagine the smell of a good Torino espresso um, versus taste, oh, sorry, not taste, uh, versus uh, actually smell um, the coffee of uh, some uh, Texas diner, it's possible that the uh, the vivacity and acuity and detail are going to be kind of matched more or less. And there are other problems, I think, with this approach. What uh, humor and prior do is that they go for a, a different approach, which I also prefer, which says that in addition to its chair equality, a perceptual chair experience also has a subtle quality of perceptuality. And it is this that distinguishes it from imag imagining chair, imaginative chair experiences, which have rather a quality of imaginativeness. So the idea here is that the phenomenology of perception and imagination is not exhausted by what's contributed to the phenomenology by the content. There is also something like mode or attitude that's relevant. So here are some, you know, um, do I need to go through what Jim Pryor says? Um, well, why not? It's not the irresistibility of our perceptual beliefs, which explains why our perceptual experiences give us the immediate justification they do. Rather, it's the peculiar phenomenal force or way our experiences have of presenting propositions to us. Force here should be heard as it is in philosophy of language to contrast with content. This feel is part of what distinguishes the attitude of perceptually experiencing that P from other propositional attitudes like belief and visual imagination. Um, prior words with the propositional attitude framework. Okay. Now, um, here's what humor says. Even if you have a very vivid, very detailed imagination, or you have very poor eyesight, you still would never confuse seeing a tomato with imagining one. The, re the reason lies in what I call the forcefulness of phenomenal experience. Oh, sorry, of perceptual experiences. Perceptual experiences represent their contents as actualized. States of merely imagining do not. When you have a visual experience of a tomato, it thereby seems to you as if the tomato is actually present then and there. So he has these two descriptors here as actualized or actually present then and there to describe the relationship that perception puts us in with contents. So the contents of imagination and perception could be matched but there is a relation to that content in which we stand when we perceive that is different from the relation in which we stand to the same content when we imagine. So the, the idea here is that perceiving a white rabbit and imagining a white rabbit can be phenomenally different even if the white rabbit presented is the same because perceiving and imagining is different. Now, how can we get underneath this uh, difference between perceiving and imagining? Remember what uh, Humer said, that uh, perceiving presents the white rabbit as actually present then and there. So I suggest that 
we think of perceiving and, the, as in, and imagining as two representational relations or intentional relations in which we might stand to the content white rabbit, but they are different relations. So uh, perceiving is something like representing is actually present here and now. This is uh, how humor seems to uh, think of it. So here, notice that uh, the words is actually present here and not, not part of the content. They, 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 they modify, they kind of describe the specific kind of relation that you stand to the content when you perceive it as opposed to imagine it. And so imagining will have a different way of representing White Rabbit. What is that way? There are various views on this. Yablo thinks that it, it is a way of representing as possible the white rabbit. I mean, it's not his expression, but uh, he thinks that uh, uh, white rabbit uh, um, or contents are presented as nearly possible in imagination. So um, here you can see a contrast between the actually and the uh, possible. Yeah, so it's a kind of contrast in the ontological orientation, if you will, that the representation takes towards the content. And uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, who had a whole, uh, actually had two books on imagination, thought of imagination actually as representing as absent. We might say representing as absent here and now to make it sound the same um, or similar to uh, the perceptual attitude. And here it's not a matter of the contrast between actual actuality and possibility, but presence and absence. So it's something more like spatial temporal orientation of the content. All right. So um, there is an objection to this whole idea that perception and imagination differ, which comes from um, experiments on, on imagination from uh, 1910, I think. And uh, these are the Perky experiments that are known to you if you've worked on imagination, where you uh, asks, ask a person to uh, imagine either a banana or an apple you sit them in front of a white screen and you project on the white screen a very, very muted kind of uh, picture of, of a banana without telling the subjects. And it's kind of, it's barely, it's barely perceived or it's like subliminally perceived. And the result is that subjects say that they imagine the banana. And some people have argued that what this means is that they're confusing what is in reality a perceptual experience for uh, an imaginative experience. So uh, apparently subjects cannot tell whether they're perceiving or imagining. So there cannot be a phenomenological difference. This is the interpretation that is sometimes presented um, in certain arguments against humor and prior. Now, I, I just have a completely different interpretation of this Perky experiment. I think it's true that these subjects do perceive a uh, banana, but I think what it happens then is that it causally primes them to imagine a banana. So they are imagining a banana in addition to perceiving a banana, and they're reporting what they're imagining. In addition, you know, nobody says that uh, phenomenology is something that we have infallible access to, and there are many other problems with this argument. So I don't worry about it too much. What I worry about is something a little different, which is that suppose perceiving white rabbit means representing is actually present here and now white rabbit and imagining a white rabbit means representing as possible or representing as absent a white rabbit. What is supposed to be so special about the perceptual attitude that allows us to believe justifiably 
that there is a white rabbit present. Yeah. Why, um, why, is, why is the imaginative attitude um, not good enough? And this can be brought out when you consider that there are many other experiential attitudes we can stand to the content white rabbit. We can, for example, recall seeing your white rabbit. And I, for one, would hold that recalling a white rabbit is a matter of representing as actually occurring in the past white rabbit. And so this is a kind of a recollection has its own way of relating to the same content. And it, it does kind of claim actuality in the way perception does. It doesn't claim the here and now bit the way perception does. In fact, it contrasts with perception in representing as past as opposed to representing as now, whatever it represents. But it does represent as actual, whatever it represents, just as perception does. And so you have different dimensions of similarity and dissimilarity across attitudes, just like you have dimensions of similarity and dissimilarity across contents. And the question is then what makes the perceptual, the specific profile of the perceptual attitude such that only it enables us to justify, uh, to justifiably believe that there is a white rabbit present. I think that the best response is actually there's nothing special. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, this was here to remind me to tell you, this is what I call the uniqueness challenge. Now, um, my view is that there's actually nothing special about perceptual experience. Each type of experience just immediately justifies a different kind of belief. And uh, perceptual experiences immediately justify perceptual beliefs, but other kinds of experience justify immediately other kinds of beliefs. And this is the only way, my, my suggestion is this is the only way for the dogmatist to the phenomenal dogmatist to neutralize the uniqueness challenge. So I think that representing is actually present here and now, white rabbit, so perceiving a white rabbit, justifies immediately the belief that a white rabbit is actually present here and now. Whereas representing as possible a white rabbit justifies immediately believing that the white rabbit is possible. And believe in, in um, recalling a white rabbit, so representing as actually occurring in the past a white rabbit, justifies immediately the belief that a white rabbit was present in the past. So what you have here is that perceiving justifies perceptual beliefs immediately. Imagining justifies modal beliefs, at least on the Yablovian view of imagining. Uh, but this is kind of a connection that many people have pointed out. And recalling justifies immediately historical beliefs, beliefs about the past. Now, notice that in each of these cases, what happens is that there is some information which in the experience is encoded into the attitude but in the belief, it becomes explicitly represented in the content. So when you switch from perceiving white rabbit to believing that the white rabbit is actually present here and now, there is information about actual presence here and now that migrates, so to speak, from the attitude to the content. And likewise, when you switch from imagining a white rabbit to believing that the white rabbit is possible, there's, info there's possibility information, the Yablovian view at least, that migrates from the experience, the imaginative experience, to the belief, the modal belief. And likewise, with recollection, you have information migrating from attitude to content. 
And so this suggests to me a kind of a general principle, which might be um, formulated as follows. When subject S undergoes an experience that represents as F some content X, S thereby has immediate prima facie epistemic justification for adopting a belief with the content of the form X is F. I'm going to read this again. When S undergoes an experience represents as F some content X, S thereby has immediate prima facie epistemic justification for adopting a belief with the content X is F. Now again, uh, yes, sorry, I, uh, I call this the experiential attitude toxastic content link or link principle for short. Now again, I have composed the haiku for your benefit. Uh, this is the portable version. It goes like this, believe anything coursing through consciousness with the right attitude. This is the link principle. Now, there are two qualifications that I want to make here. It's not every day that the haiku gets qualifiers, but uh, I want to point out two limitations of um, the link principle. First, it must be the case, so bringing back the link principle, it must be the case that the representing as F in the experience is part of the phenomenology because we're, we're here trying to defend phenomenal dogmatism, not just any kind of dogmatism, but phenomenal dogmatism. So the principle must require that the representing as F um, be phenomenally manifest, be manifest in the phenomenology of the subject. Of course, there are people, uh, so-called pure representationalists, who hold that attitude or mode is never manifest in the phenomenology, that the only thing that, uh, that the thing that exhausts the phenomenology of experiences is content. But um, many people have rejected this, including Tim. So that's one qualification I think we need to add that this would have to be a phenomenal way of representing as F. And the second is, since we're talking about immediate justification, I think the experience that we're dealing with would have to be the kind of experience that doesn't need to um, itself be justified by something else. Because if it does need to be justified by something else, then whatever justifies it would also be involved in justifying the belief with the content X is F. And so this would not be immediate justification. Um, and so what we need to require, I think, is that the, the experiences for which this principle applies would be experiences that cannot be epistemically unjustified. And for most dogmatists, uh, perceptual experiences, for example, cannot be uh, epistemically unjustified because they, uh, they are not accessible epistemically in the first place. They are not the kinds of things that can be justified or unjustified epistemically. It's, it's uh, for the dogmatist, it's typically considered a kind of a category mistake to say that the perceptual experience is epistemically unjustified. This is controversial, but this is something that uh, needs to be part of the picture here. There is, of course, another option, which is that the perceptual experiences or whatever other experiences we consider here would cannot be unjustified for another reason, which is that they're they're just kind of guaranteed to be justified. So they're uh, you might say that they're incorrigible or incorrigibility is to justification, what infallibility is to truth. So um, this leads me to a principle I call link plus, and which reads as follows, for any experience E, if one, E cannot be unjustified, and two, E phenomenally represents S, sorry, represents as F some content X, 
then E provides immediate prima facie epistemic justification for believing that X is F. This is all I wanted to tell you really that uh, this principle is the kind of thing the phenomenal dogmatist should incorporate into her view in order to um, neutralize the uniqueness challenge. But I think there's a lot um, to be said for this principle, and I'm going to end with some um, virtues of this principle, the, what I call link plus. So, of course, there is the point that it meets the uniqueness challenge, but there's also the point, this was uh, pointed out to me by Anna Justina, that it's uh, the, the extension of phenomenal dogmatism beyond the perceptual case to the imaginative case, the uh, uh, recollective case, and maybe other cases, is motivated by the same kind of everyday examples that usually motivate phenomenal dogmatists when they discuss the perceptual case. So, you know, uh, Jim Pryor um, says somewhere that the best argument for dogmatism is the argument from examples, which means if you just reflect, if you just reflect on everyday examples, you will see that it's a very plausible view. So uh, think about it this way. Um, uh, you see, um, you see uh, your friend Dave, and someone says to you, "How uh, how do you know Dave um, Dave is present? What uh, what makes you so sure that Dave is present?" You say, "Well, I'm looking right at him. There's Dave." And it seems like a very natural response. That this is kind of it's uh, it's a bit epistemically demanding to ask you to like cite further considerations to be prima facie justified, mind you. That it's not, we're not talking about ultima facie justification here. To be prima facie justified that Dave is in the room, you just need to have a perceptual experience of Dave. Uh, that's uh, in most circumstances that would give that would justify you in believing that he's in the, in the room. Now, if you think about uh, how this extends to memory, if someone says to you, um, how can you be sure that uh, Tim gave the talk, the previous talk? You say, hey, I, uh, I recall it very clearly. It was, was barely an hour ago. It wasn't even an hour ago. I remember it very clearly. And this seems like a very natural way to justify yourself when uh, asked, why do you believe, how, how can you be so sure that Tim gave, the previous, Tim gave the previous talk? And um, likewise, if someone asks you, how can you be so sure that pigs can fly? Uh, or let's rephrase it. Uh, how can you be so sure that flying pigs are possible? It's actually a bit tricky because uh, possible and can and could are used by the folk usually to, to express not metaphysical or logical or conceptual possibility, but gnomic possibility. Um, so this... Uh, Well, imagine you are trying to, you, you want to move your desk from the living room to the bedroom and someone says, how can you be so sure that it will pass through the door? You say, well, I'm imagining it. It's, it's so much smaller than the door is so much wider than, the, than this desk. I can imagine clearly how it passes through. So these are, there is kind of a natural extension uh, of the motivation, the original motivation from, for phenomenal dogmatism from the perceptual case to other cases. There is also um, another virtue, which is 
it we seem to be blameless when we move from perceiving um you know um, a desk to believing that the desk is present and why should we be blameless we are believing we are we are believing a uh, we, we are entering a a mental state, a, a belief that uh, no other belief justifies. And the idea that there is information that is already present in the experience, and it's not arriving into the belief out of nowhere, it comes to the belief from the experience. It's just that in the experience, it was in the attitude and coded in the attitude, whereas in the belief, it is explicit in the content. But there is still a kind of a, information, there's no new information that's being kind of incorporated into the belief. It's, uh, it's information that the system was already representing, or it was already encoded in the system's representational states, I should say. I think that kind of, it goes some way towards uh, justifying. Um, Matteo, you're trying to tell me something, I think. Are you telling me that there's five minutes? I need only four. Um, okay. There is a certain division of epistemic labor here in this picture between attitude and content. Um, the attitude that an experience has or the mode decides the kind of belief. Um, that gets that gets justified because perceptual experience has the kind of representational attitude that it does the kind of beliefs that it justifies are perceptual beliefs rather than modal beliefs or imagine or um, historical beliefs and it's because recollection has the kind of uh, attitude that it does that what it justifies is historical beliefs rather than other kinds of beliefs. So it's the it's the attitude that decides what kind of belief can be immediately justified. But it's the content of the experience that decides what specific uh, belief of that kind can be epistemically justified. A white rabbit um, belief or uh, desk belief or tomato belief or whatever. So there is a kind of an elegant, and this is kind of the next point, is a kind of an elegant and unified account of how phenomenal justification works. And it comes uh, from um, more fully appreciating the attitude content structure, the intentional structure involving both attitude and content, both mode and object, as it sometimes uh, put, that phenomenal experiences have. And a sixth advantage that uh, I correctly uh, suspected I may not have a lot of time to go into is that there are cases in the literature where a kind of a dogmatism is debated and Link Plus will give us a handle on how to move forward. So I can't really go into this, but some people have held that emotional experiences immediately justify evaluative beliefs. Uh, somewhat in the way perceptual experiences immediately justify perceptual beliefs. And so other people's ha people have denied this and there's something of a debate in the literature. And um, here we have a, a theoretical perspective with which to kind of move forward on this debate. We just say, well, does Link produce the right result? Which means here, are emotional experiences the kind of things that have phenomenal representing as if that we can detect? And are they the kind of states that um, that cannot be unjustified? Both of these points have been uh, disputed in the literature. But however that um, turns out will produce a kind of uh, verdict for us. Or Link Plus will help us produce a verdict on this kind of debate. And so these are the uh, these are the advantages of Link Plus a principle, a kind of a structural principle connecting experiential attitudes with doxastic contents that kind of undergirds and underlies, I propose, 
um, immediate phenomenal justification. Now, there are other problems with the idea of phenomen immediate phenomenal justification coming from Bayesian epistemology, from Salercian reflections on what it takes to justify that none of this speaks to. Um, this speaks only to one issue, the uniqueness challenge. Um, and uh, um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Uriah and Julia, the floor is yours. So I'd like to share my screen if that works. Just so you can look at a pretty picture of a chair by Francesca Woodman in the meantime. Um, so it was great paper and fun presentation. I'm just going to make uh, three comments or raise three questions for further discussion. Um, one takes a little bit longer to set up, but the other ones should be quite quick. Um, so to begin with, just to remind us all, uh, the main claim that is at stake is phenomenal dogmatism, the claim that some perceptual experiences provide immediate prima facie epistemic justification of certain beliefs and do so in virtue of some of their phenomenal properties. It's then a question or a challenge for the view, it's what's special about perceptual experiences as opposed to some other kinds of experiences. And Uriah's favourite answer is that actually imaginative, perceptual, um, memory experiences and possibly some others all provides immediate prima facie justification in virtue of their phenomenology, uh, but each for their own kind of belief. So perception provides immediate prima facie justification for perceptual beliefs, imagination for modal beliefs or beliefs about uh, chairs being possibly present, uh, memory or recollective experience about historical beliefs or beliefs about past chairs. And this is because each kind of experience has a distinctive attitude and the attitude shows up in the phenomenology. Um, now, a first question is what exactly the phenomenal difference between a perceptual experience of a certain chair, of a chair and an imaginative experience of an identically looking chair is. Um, so Uriah allows that the difference is not just a difference of vividness and detail because we could have potentially an equally as vivid imaginative experience as a certain visual experience. Instead, he seems to think that there is a distinctive phenomenal property uh, I guess a generic or content independent phenomenal property that characterizes each attitude, say a per perceptuality, or sometimes he calls it uh, maybe a force or a, 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 presenting, a presenting as actual type of property and an imaginative, imaginativeness uh, property. So these are phenomenal properties. Um, and now I was trying to understand what exactly these two properties would be. So I agree that at least normally imaginative and perceptual experiences uh, that seem to present one with the same scene still have an overall different phenomenal profile. But I was thinking that this doesn't seem to be a matter of their having each a distinctive phenomenal quality, per uh, perceptuality and imaginativeness respectively, but rather of having a range of features that distinguishes them, which could be vividness and detail, but also the fact that uh, your perceptual experience of a chair is integrated with your perceptual experience of the overall scene and uh, with the viewing conditions like lighting and shading or your point of view in a way that an imaginative experience that you could have right now as of a chair being in your room is not. Uh, Similarly, there seems to be in some sort of integration between your current uh, visual experiences of a chair and some prior experiences just, you just said that might not be there in the case of imagining uh, a chair. And also other aspects, for instance, 
Uh, usually perceptions are resistance to the will in a way that uh, imaginative experiences are not, and there could be others. So um, if that's the case, then it seems that if we do allow that an imaginative experience can be extraordinarily detailed, extraordinarily vivid, integrated, resistant to the will, then it seems we are allowing that it could have the same phenomenal profile as a corresponding perceptual experience of an identically looking chair. And then at that point, I kind of lost track of what the reason would be why this imaginative experience does not provide immediate prima facie justification for the very same type of beliefs about there being a chair that a perceptual experience does. Uh, so what would, be the, what would be the reason to think that there is still a quality missing from one experience that the other one has? Um, and I guess it, Uriah didn't talk about it uh, now, but in the paper it was mentioning that the phenomenal uh, dogmatist is someone that thinks a uh, hallucinatory experience could also provide immediate prima facie justification. And at that point, I wasn't sure what the difference would be between an imaginative experience that has this phenomenal profile and, say, a hallucinatory experience. So that's the first question. Second question is, just to get the discussion started really about the notion of um, each experience representing its content as F. Um, so as actual or here and now, as possible, as past. Um, so you rise very clear, this isn't a matter of the content of the experience, it's not that we see uh, possibility or pastness. Um, also it doesn't seem to be a matter of a higher order content, uh, although there is this talk of representing as. And so I was wondering whether it could say something more about what that would be. Um, so one option would be it's a matter of the functional role of the experience, or maybe of the sort of dispositions that the subject has in virtue of having that experience. So for instance, having a certain perceptual experience um, that presents or represents a chair as actual or as present here and now is a matter of one's being disposed to believe or to, to judge that the chair is here and now. And whether that would be somewhat circular or whether it's something that we're happy with. Or just to say more about this representing as if it's not a matter of content. And the final question uh, was just a quick question about the sort of contents um, that imaginative experiences on the one end and uh, memory experience and perceptual experiences on the other can have and the respective contents of the belief that they immediately prima facie justify. So it seems that perceptual experiences and memory experiences can be of particulars. I have a visual experience of, of this laptop. I remember seeing that person. Uh, whereas imaginative experiences seem to have generic or just existentially quantified contents. I imagine a chair, but I'm not imagining a particular chair, it seems. So if that's the case, there seems to be an, another important distinction already between different sorts of experiences that isn't a matter of their attitudes, uh, because some of them can't have particular contents. Uh, so whether Uriah would be happy to accept this or what he thinks about that. And that's it. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Uriah, if you want to reply to Julia. I do. Thank you, Julia. These are great points at least one in three are great. I zoned out on two because I was thinking about what I should say about one. And so I might want you to repeat what uh, point two was very soon. But on one, um, yeah, there are several, there's a couple of really good points you're making. The first is that, well, the first that I would make, it's not exactly the way you meant it, but the way I would make it is um, even if there is this difference, attitudinal difference about manners of representing that I'm talking about, representing as F versus representing as G, there seem to be a number of other differences, uh, like uh, issues of the, how it integrates uh, into other things, how uh, it resists to the will and so there's one question that you one might raise is uh, 
why not bank on these features rather than on those that I am banking on to, to do the epistemic di uh, difference, to account for the epistemic difference. But in addition, you say, once we try to match for all of these features, you say, I'm not, I'm not getting this additional thing that you're claiming, this representing as F versus representing as G that occurs in the two experiences. The first thing I want to say about that is in terms of just how the paper works, I am just working here with something that both Pryor and Humor seem to agree on, that there is something that goes to the force, where force needs to be heard like attitude more or less. Um, you know, elocutionary uh, force and all that stuff. Um, it's a bit like attitude or mode uh, in the mind. But in addition, I recognize that these kinds of phenomenal features are going to be very, very subtle, much more subtle than uh, the quality of pain or red. And so they're more controversial and so someone could legitimately deny that they really are part of our stream of consciousness. But I think the actually the case of the contrast of imagination and hallucination is useful here because the difference for me is that hallucination seems to be the kind of thing that tells you this is really happening. Now, it may be accompanied by a belief, you know, if you're high on acid and you have this kind of hallucinatory experience, you may at the same time have a belief that kind of vetoes that experience and, and says, do not endorse this experience. Uh, do not, uh, th this, the experience misrepresents the world. But the ex as far as the experience itself, is concerned, what it says is that this is how the world is. And this is different from imagination, um, I want to say. And so this is now, there is a point about the will resistance that I, I find that it's, it's particularly hard to create a match uh, of will resistance because you could, it's a legitimate hypothesis to say it's because, you know, um, imagination does not resist the will that we know that this, this stuff comes from us and not from the world or something like that. And so I recognize that there is something there that requires more digging into. And um, I don't really know immediately what to say. Um, I suppose I have to kind of suggest that even when we talk about imagine, imaginative experiences that come to us unbidden, um, um, they justify modal beliefs, but not perceptual beliefs. Yeah. Now, like I said, point two I missed. Um, can you say very quickly uh, what it was? So it was just uh, a request to have a bit more of an explanation of what you could represent it as uh, to amount to. So I guess in the, in the slides you used this iPhone, iPhoneated construction. So that might help. Um, because when I hear talk of experience representing its content as, I mean, representing as to me, reminds me of talk of content, but you may declare that uh, the pathness, the actuality, the possibility, they're not part of the content. And I take it they're also not part of some sort of higher order content. It's built into the attitude, you say, in the paper baked into the attitude. Um, so are you using the talk of representing as to help yourself to something? Or I was thinking maybe you think that there's some connection between uh, the experience and the sort of more general dispositions that one has in virtue of having that experience. And so one might think um, having a certain visual experience that presents you with a chair is actual or presents is actual with a chair, um, disposes you to have a belief that, yeah. and that's why we talk of, 
of representing it. So you're just helping yourself to that notion, but it's nothing to do with representation. That, that was the main question. Yeah. Uh, so I want to say it does have something to do with representation, but not with what is being represented, but with how it's being represented. So there is, there is, you know, the thing that's being represented, or you know, the content, and then there are, I want to say their representation really is a genus that has many species. Now, the correct way to name these species is representing one, representing two, representing three, representing four, and so on. And just assign a number to each of the however many experiential and non-experiential ways of representing we have, ways of relating representationally to content. Now, these kind of hyphenated expressions are intended to wink at how, what, what is the special, so what is, they kind of describe, there's something kind of uh, um, I, I am helping myself here to something that I'm not allowed to in some sense because uh, they really should be just numbered relations. And I'm putting these words in there by way of winking to the ki kind of uh, giving you an indirect uh, grasp of what these uh, representation relations are. Now, um, and what distinguishes them one for the other. Now, the thing that justifies, I think, using those words and not others in each case, uh, what I really believe is that it, it's because those are the things, those are the words we would use to express the beliefs that we can justifiably form by endorsing these kinds of experiences. Of course, if I say it here as part of the paper, the whole thing becomes circular, but it, it is really what I believe uh, uh, justifies the use of these particular words. So that's a good point. And the third point was also a very good point about uh, singular versus existentially quantified contents. Now you made some claims that one can accept, but one may not. For example, that perceptual experience is singular content rather than ex uh, existentially quantified content. You know, some people, uh, some people think that you, you can strictly, you cannot strictly speaking see your mother you can what what the what the visual experience says is not here's mama but here is an x such that x is and then you just add all the features all the vis visible feature of mama that's a view now this is a very good question how the question i I don't know what, I can psych myself into the singular view and into the uh, existentially quantified view, um, depending on the days of the week uh, for each of these. Also for imagination, by the way, I think I can, uh, actually, can I, can I imagine Russell? I think I can imagine Russell. Am I failing and am I just imagining a, uh, X such that X it looks like Russell? Um, I don't know. These are very difficult questions for me. I don't know what to think about them. And there is a good question about how that interacts in terms of uh, um, should we, does, does that kind of feed back into how we should think about the adi experiential attitude in each case or not? And what the, uh, the, the epistemological differences might be there? I confess that I just haven't thought about this, but it's, it's, uh, it is worth thinking about.